Our next feature speaker um, is also from UW Madison. Um, his name is Richard Gaillard, and we, he is a uh, PhD student in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Um, and his dissertation research involves using some of the, extending some of the models uh, that we've been talking about here today for decision support tools and educational tools. So today he's going to talk to us about some of the models he's been working on. All right, so I'm going to talk about a model comparison we performed under the Dairy Cap grant. And because meeting the objectives of Dairy Cap uh, involves using a lot of models, we wanted to take a step to compare how some of the models we were using to evaluate into a flux from the agricultural fields were performing. And I want to say that when you get into model evaluation, it gets pretty heavy on the analysis and the statistics. So there's a lot of information on some of my slides. I'm going to do my best to just kind of focus on the takeaways and not get bogged down in the figures, but like Becky said, they'll be available online so you can look at them later. And I've also got some appendix slides at the very end uh, that kind of flesh out some of the details. So we perform model comparisons uh, because models are being used in increasingly broad applications. Uh, some of these are to evaluate land use and management effects. They're also used to construct regional greenhouse gas inventories, which are useful policy tools. Uh, and there are a way of understanding future impacts of climate change on agriculture. And so these applications have some pretty significant implications. And so we want to take time to compare the models and evaluate their performance, and also to try and find if there's any way or areas in which the, needles, uh, the models need to be improved. And we wanted to use multiple data sets to represent uh, multiple contexts that the models are often applied in and give a general idea of how the models were performing, not necessarily in a specific data set or a specific uh, place on the landscape. And we also wanted to look at the use of a multi-model ensemble to either improve estimates of N2O or to reduce error. Uh, and a multi-model ensemble simply means taking the average of individual model esti estimates and then comparing that average against observed data. So the objectives of this study were to independently calibrate three models to compare estimations of observed data, specifically in 2O flux, to look at an ensemble model. And we also wanted to get our data set sample size up pretty high so that we could perform a linear regression to see if these models had tendencies across contexts. These are the three models that we used, and I'm not going to get into too much detail in them, but you can see in the, the graphical de descriptions that they can be pretty different. So we used DNDC, Descent, and Epic, and each of these models have been repeatedly tested and validated for simulating multiple agroecosystem properties and, of course, also for N2O from agricultural fields. I'm going to talk quickly about the data set that we use. So we use data from three different collection studies over two sites in Wisconsin. In Arlington, we had three cropping systems that included three different crops, corn, soybean, and alfalfa. And in Marshfield, we had four different fertilizer or manure treatments, all growing corn. And the blue cells, I've indicated the years in which the data was used to construct the calibration data set. And so that means that's the data that we tried to force the models to represent or to simulate. And then we also withheld data in the red cells as a validation data set, which we used to test our, the results of our calibration and find out whether the models were predicting data when they weren't specifically forced to. And those uh, studies gave us pretty high sample sizes, especially when you compare with other modeling exercises in the literature. So our calibration uh, was about 350 and validation 500 or so, and a little bit different based upon you know, integrity of measurements and whatnot. So, uh, those were our sample sizes. This is the data that we used to parameterize the models. So this is what was held constant across all three models. But after that data, we allowed all the individual modelers to parameterize the models or set settings as they saw fit or appropriate as for best practice with their model. And the reason that we did that was one, because the models are differently constructed, it's more or less impractical, if not impossible, to make sure that they're all doing exactly the same thing, for instance, with how fast or how slow carbon turns over. And another reason we wanted to do that is we really wanted to see how these models were performing as if they were independently applied or contracted to simulate data in the field to give us an idea of where, what the error or the model performance might be in uh, more you know, real world applications. So that's our data set. And before we get into the N2O data, I wanted to take a step to talk about what good model performance looks like. And 
So the first thing you want to, and soil temperature gives us a good way to do that because it's relatively easy for the models to predict. And the first thing you want to look at is whether the validation and calibration are similar. And we can see visually that they are if we look at the calibration data set on top and the validation data set in red on the bottom, that just visually they look very similar. And if you get into some of the metrics listed here, those also kind of match up. You know, the main thing you recognize is that there's a little bit more error associated in the validated data set, but that makes sense because we weren't forcing the models to predict that data. The next thing you want to look at is uh, modeling efficiency or the e-statistic, which is basically just a way of telling if the model is out predicting a mean observation. And so if your e-statistic e is greater than zero, it means that your model was outperforming the mean. That's good. Uh, you also want low error, so the root mean squared error tells us basically how far away from observations the simulated data was, and in the case of soil temperature, we're about one to three degrees away from observations on average, and that's pretty good. You also want to look for high correlation or that the models are explaining variation in the data and that it's significant and not random. And the thing that we get extra with linear regression is to look at whether the models have a tendency to under or over predict data relative to the magnitude of observations. And so what you want is the beta one estimate, the slope estimate, to be one to one, which is represented by this, or to be one, which is represented by this one to one line here. And so we look at all this with soil temperature, and we conclude that the models are accurately estimating the observed data. However, we do have a little bit of a caveat. If we look at some of the models beta one estimates, they're a little bit below one. Uh, data set's actually a little bit higher than one. But that basically means in the case where they're below one, that as observed soil temperature gets higher, the models start to underpredict that temperature. And that becomes a little bit more pronounced in N2O in a moment. So these are the results for our daily N2O flux, and we have what I would characterize here as more limited model performance. And I say it's limited because it's still better than mean estimates, at least in the case of Descent, Epic, and the Ensemble, because the E statistic is greater than zero modeling efficiency is better than observed uh, means, except in the case of DNDC, which didn't really do a very good job of predicting N2O, uh, and that may be an artifact of how it's calibrated. Can't say for sure, and I don't have much time to get into it. But at least uh, the Descent, Epic, and Ensemble models are, are doing pretty well. They have what for daily N2O flux is a pretty high and significant correlation with the observed data, and daily N2O is typically very difficult for models to capture. And so if you kind of compare it with the literature values, these are actually pretty good. However, we have a whole lot of error associated with the root mean squared error estimate. And basically, the error is either approximately or greater to mean flux, which was 0 0.015 kilograms of N2O in per hectare. And just to kind of give a, a, a relative comparison, where soil temperature was one to three degrees off, uh, a similar error for soil temperature would be about 17 to 20 degrees. So it's a whole lot of error, and it reduces our confidence in the ability of the models to hit uh, observations accurately. And also what we have is some pretty significant underestimations of high or peak observed flux. And we know that because the slope estimate is below one. And you can just visually assess, too, that the regression line stays pretty far below the one-to-one -one slope. And so that means that as, uh, as observed flux gets higher, the models are staying pretty low and not able to hit the peak flux. And that becomes a problem because the top 10% of observed fluxes in our data set accounted for 55% of total observed flux. And so what we kind of infer from that is that the models are likely unpredict under predicting a majority of the total observed flux. Now, a lot of times with these daily into o flux evaluations, the claim of uh, modeling exercises is that they perform better in cumulative estimates, which is what we're kind of concerned with in terms of policy development, how much uh, N2O or greenhouse gas is coming off the landscape over time, uh, over time scales larger than a day. But what we see in our data is that it looks like the daily bias towards underestimating peak flux also translates into a cumulative bias. Because again, we can just look at the, the slope of the regression line and see that the models stay pretty low when observed fluxes are getting very high. And that's a problem, one, because we're concerned with uh, the models getting those high fluxes right because they're the most impactful for climate change. But also in some other analysis, we found that the models are also under predicting mean flux. So not only are they under predicting the high fluxes, but they're generally getting it low as well. However, 
They're still better than mean estimates, at least in the case of descent, epic, and the ensemble. And we know that because the E statistic or modeling efficiency is greater than zero. And so I want to make the point here that the advantage of doing linear regression in this study is that we get a little bit of extra information about how the models are performing. If we just look at the error, the correlation, and the uh, modeling efficiency, we would actually conclude that these models are performing pretty well. But because our slope estimate is significantly below one, we also know that the models are not hitting the fluxes that we're really the most interested in. And so other than identifying this bias, we also want to try and explain it. And one way you can do that is to look at some other data that was collected at the same time as the N2O. So we know that soil temperature and soil moisture, when they're higher, associated with conditions for peak N2O flux. And they're also the data that's typically collected alongside N2O measurements. However, we weren't able to use that data to sufficiently explain why the models were underestimating flux. So they tended to kind of underestimate N2O when they were underestimating N2O and soil moisture, but the, the relationship wasn't very significant. So really at this point in the level of analysis that we were in and the data that we had, we're left with only the conclusion that the models seem to be biased towards under predictions and we're not really able to explain it uh, thoroughly. However, we do know that there's several other factors in the environment and specifically in the modeling environment that directly influence N2O flux and we were able to at least do a relative comparison of the models to see where they were at in some of these more influential variables. So the way we did that was to use the ensemble as a baseline for comparing the models against both each other and the average estimate and that looks like this. So we have the ensemble average on the x-axis and the individual models on the y-axis and it tells us where the models are in relation to the average of each other. And what we see for soil temperature and soil moisture that the models tend to converge on data that we had for calibration. So especially in the high areas, the models get together. DNDC is a little bit low in soil moisture, but when we're in the conditions that the models are simulating high flux, they're all in about the same place. So this tells us at least for that data, the models are being consistent. There's some understanding or, or thing we just find out later that's uh, a problem with those two variables, at least the models are all doing the same thing. However, we can look at four other variables that are more influential in the model environments to N2O flux than soil temperature and soil moisture. Those are soil respiration, uh, soil ammonium and nitrate, and the rates of denitrification. And we see that for data that we didn't have for calibrations, the models get really far apart from each other, especially when one or several models are higher in one of these variables. And so what this tells us is, because the models were hitting approximately the same N2O numbers, they may have been doing it for very different reasons. And that's practically, that's not possible for it to happen in the field, right? So one of these models are all of them are getting to N2O fluxes, uh, possibly incorrectly. And it also makes it very hard for us to have confidence in our extension of model results outside of data that we have for calibration. And it gives uh, a lot of, potential error if these models are uh, incorporated eventually into LCA analysis or models, or especially if the models are this different model selection, if you're just selecting one to inform further analysis might have a pretty large impact on your ultimate conclusions. So basically what we take from this is that uh, the models are in agreement for soil moisture and temperature, but that doesn't ensure agreement in other variables. And also, it's very <coughs> difficult to determine why the models are underestimating the flux in our data set when there's so much variation in these variables that are really more directly related in the model uh, equations to N2O flux. So that brings us kind of to the overall conclusions. Um, basically, the models we think are maybe underestimating greenhouse gas flux in the form of nitrous oxide from agricultural fields. And um, you know, N2O is the most significant greenhouse gas from agricultural fields, so that's one of our primary concern. And they're at least and certainly doing it in our data set. However, I think the next step should be a more a meta-analysis that incorporates more models or at least more context or evaluates pre-published literature um, to see if this underestimation is an artifact of our data set or is really something that we're missing in our model construction. Also, because each of the models was similarly biased to these underestimations, our model ensemble couldn't improve or reduce error in our estimates of N2O. Um, so, you know, for instance, 
in the global circulation models, you would want to use several models to reduce error and arrive at a more confident prediction of future climate. We're not really able to do the same thing, I think, with N2O, with these models at least. And also, because there was significant variation in the model estimates of these other variables, I think that indicates that we really need some more data in order to calibrate the models, or at least to resolve and explain the reason why these models are underestimating N2O. And I think that's another important next step for the both modeling and the measurement communities, so I just wanted to take a minute to talk about what that data set might look like. And I think addressing this problem of underestimation, you know, if it exists consistently, requires a more philosophical re realignment in how we're collecting data, not just for model testing, but for model improvement. So we don't really need data for um, cropping systems over multiple years, measured it every week or every other week. What I think we really need is data that's measured at higher frequencies every day or multiple times of a day, especially around peak fluxes, so that we're getting a more accurate idea of how these models are performing at these kind of really sensitive times. And also, you know, just kind of reiterate that we need to make sure we have maximized our confidence in our observed data because some of the collection techniques uh, are biased towards under predictions or underestimations themselves. Um, collecting into O data is really time and resource intensive, so that's certainly a challenge, but you know, if we want to have more confidence in our model, it's something we need to look at. Similarly, we need more types of simultaneous data collection, especially if we're going to diagnose uh, problems and underestimation that we found. And you know, one, one of the more influential factors in, into a production in the environment and in, in the model environment is just how much nitrogen is in the soil. So if, we get, if we're getting soil NO3 and NH4 at the same time that we're getting into O estimates and soil temperature and soil moisture, that can go a long way to helping to calibrate our model and, and, and diagnosing some problems. And again, although that is also more time and resource intensive, if we limit our collection periods to smaller time frames, then perhaps that can mitigate some of the additional cost. Uh, and also, I think we need to just focus on building data sets that reflect the model environment. So, for instance, we had soil moisture and soil temperature measured from the 0 to 15 or 0 to 20 layer, but in the models, those la that 0 to 20 centimeters is broken out into several discrete layers. And so if we want to diagnose what the models are doing or accurately reflect what's happening in the field, we need to have uh, more finer resolution of data collection when we're uh, trying to to simulate the complex processes that are contributing to N2O uh, flux from the fields. And actually that kind of brings me right to my final remark, which is that, you know, I don't want this work to completely torpedo models as use, useful for uh, estimating N2O, because really they still are useful, and practically they're our only way to estimate N2O, especially where it's impractical or impossible to collect physical data. And oftentimes, um, well, I said it, they're our only way to get this data. But there still seems to be a lot more left, work left to be done in just building our understanding, or at least our understanding of how to simulate this biophysical environment, and especially if we're going to harmonize the models and improve our, our confidence and the consistency in the models when they're used to evaluate management and certainly to inform and develop policy. And with that, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors on the paper we submitted and acknowledge the funding body and also the support of the Dairy Cap staff. And I guess that puts me at time for questions. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> really interesting. We might have a time for a few questions if you've got them out there. Uh, overall, looking at all your data, which one of these models that you evaluated do you think did the best job in the Um. Well, I mean, we tried to not draw that conclusion, okay. but uh, just from my experience, and uh, disclaimer, I'm the Descent modeler, so I am partial, but objectively, um, Epic kind of did the best, and I, I think the reason it did so is because it's got a better soil uh, hydrology model in it, and it did a lot better in the soil moisture analysis and also in some of the N2O, so, I mean, I guess you didn't have to twist my arm too hard. <laughs> yes? Uh, do all these models, or the ones you consider, describe the process of uh, nitrous oxide uh, formation and 
is the same way. So what I'm saying, the equations that are used in here, you see this and all the others, are they the same? They are not. They are not. Um, so they are a little bit different. Um, DNDC, I think, works with um, kind of the, the electron transfer, free electron scale, and um, DASIN is more kind of empirical uh, relationships between soil moisture and water fill pore space. So, you know, that level analysis is difficult to get into with a data set as large as we had, especially when we didn't collect it. Um, it's certainly, you know, something that we are thinking about exploring in more detail uh, to, you know, trying to explain some of these differences in the models based upon their equations. But I think the takeaway is that they were basically all doing the same thing. So where they are you know, different in their, how they're calculating in 2 and perhaps they're all missing something similar. All right, thank you. And with that, I'm going to try to stay on time. And thanks again, Richard. Really interesting. <laughs>